Perfect. We can get started. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on another um, um, forum uh, for me forum. Now we have uh, all the forums set up on the first Tuesday of every month. Um, I have a note that on the Ju July uh, call, it will coincide with uh, 4th of July. So we'll reach out with a new date for that one. But our next meeting is on June 6th. Um, and um, as, as always, if you do not have any of the um, uh, calendar invites, please let me know. I can go ahead and send it out. We have a calendar event until the end of the year, <clears throat> but I will um, definitely um, hope that we continue this, these meetings and uh, hope to hear from every one of you um, after the call, before the call, during the call, and let's keep this lively. And, and, and I wanna hear more about what you um, think we should be doing in these calls. Uh, for now, let's go ahead and get into our agenda. Um, again, thank you so much for, for joining us today. I had a few updates, but I will save much of the updates um, uh, towards the end of the call where we will have an open discussion. But I know I don't know if many of you have looked at the latest uh, reports that DEED had released. Um, one was the, um, the, um, the way that immigration does help our economy. And um, it did point out that we had um, immigration um, slowdown during the after the 2016 due to the um, due to the immigration policies. And so um, that release that we did was actually showing that uh, immigration has a significant impact on the US labor market. Um, and the decline in the immigration between uh, 2017 and our around 2021 um, was primarily due to um, government policies. And, um, and that shows that every policy that uh, the government makes um, to transform the immigration system, um, we need to be careful on how that will impact the, um, the US labor market. And of course, Minnesota is, is, um, is, is part of that, uh, those affected. Um, <clears throat> So we wanna make sure that we highlight the important role of immigration in, in, in terms of um, the labor market and how um, changing the immigration uh, will impact uh, the jobs and even you know, entrepreneurship and um, startup market, um, startup environment in our state. Um, what we will advise policymakers is to uh, consider the potential impact of immigration policies and so that's what the numbers can help us to emphasize and show that um, as immigration uh, declines, um, the, the, the economy does also uh, change and there's an impact, a direct correlation. So I don't know if you looked at those uh, reports, but I can share that link. Um, the other um, you know, um, update that I wanna share is, please um, look at those numbers and let us discuss and start this conversation on how um, immigration affects our, our, our work and the work that we do. Um, let me save the rest of the updates for later. I wanted to highlight those important um, points, but I will um, go ahead and invite uh, Devin uh, to speak to uh, the owner bill. Uh, but before I do, um, last session when we attended uh, this call, we had focused solely on the Office of New Americans and the bill that we have going through the state legislation, the state legislature. And uh, we wanted to just follow up and tell you what has happened since then and where we are uh, passing the, the owner bill. And now is, um, it's part of the omnibus bill. So maybe Devin, um, you can also tell people, you know, it would maybe talk a little bit more about what the omnibus bill is and how that affects um, uh, going forward. Over to you, Devin. Sure. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner. Uh, Devin Bowdry, Legislative Liaison here at DEED. Um, the owner bill. So we're at the point in the legislative session now where the House and the Senate have both passed their own versions of the omnibus bill. So a bill comprised of many bills, it's many pages long. Um, the, the really good news is that Office of New Americans was included in both the House and the Senate. And so then they passed those off the floor, but for a bill to become law, you know, both bills need to be, um, uh, both the House and the Senate need to pass an identical bill. And right now, the, um, 
the owner bill looks a bit different on both sides. Um, the the main difference, and maybe this has been discussed in, with this group before, is that the House funds the uh, owner at $3 million, and on the Senate side, it's $1.5 million. That's the, the main difference. Um, but once they, they negotiate that, which is what they're starting to do this week, once they negotiate kind of the, the dollar amount, the policy language also needs to look identical. And there are still some differences between the House and the Senate. I would say in, in reading over it, um, I don't think there would be any huge sticking points. I think a lot of the, the differences are kind of stylistic or technical. Um, nothing that like would really change the office um, one way or the other. Um, but there is some additional, I, I think the Senate language is a bit more specific, um, more robust, um, and it also includes uh, language on the Senate side about how ONA would then work with the ethnic councils and kind of wanting to make sure that everybody's role is, is clearly defined, how the ethnic councils will um, approach uh, new Americans and how ONA will approach new Americans. So this is the first week where the, the House and the Senate have come together to um, begin discussing their bills. Yesterday, they just did a walkthrough of what's in each side's bill, um, very, very just procedural uh, committee hearing. Today, they did a little bit more. The first thing they'll do then is adopt or, or take action on um, things that are same uh, in both their bills or pretty similar, where it's like just kind of you know, style differences. Um, and so I, I think the good news is that, you know, ONA is in both bills, um, but also, you know, you never want to celebrate until it's all completely done. But we're in a good, in a good position here um, to see ONA cross the finish line. And so I'll put it in the chat here. This is a link to um, what they call the side-by-sides. So committee legislative staff will put together um, this document that shows, you know, on one side, the House version, on the other side, the Senate version, and the blue highlighting, uh, they'll kind of line up the programs that are similar. So ONA begins on page R2. Um, the language that is highlighted in blue is language that is, is different between the two bills. So you can uh, read that for yourself um, and, and see how they compare. I'm not sure which uh, side they'll kind of end up taking or if they'll do like a mix of both. Um, so that, that remains to be seen, but should uh, come out in the coming days here. Yeah, I think that's all I have. Thank you so much. That's really great to um, have that side by side. Um, and so you, folks, you can always look at the bill and um, I don't know if it's too late for uh, people to get involved, but I understand that the if it has passed the council, uh, both the Senate and the House, now it's up to the committee to to decide and do the the negotiation. So um, um, I don't know what you folks can get involved in, but that's um, um, that's what what we have out there uh, on the two bills, and of course there is the um, the governor's uh, proposal, which is Beat's proposal as well. That's also there. Uh, and, and that will be part of the committee, um, um, a seat at the table. Just one other question, Devin, because the, we, I know some of the folks are looking into other uh, bills that did uh, the sponsoring, and I know we have gone through uh, the one Minnesota budget and, and the deed um, legislative ideas that were in the, in the, in the budget. But I am, I'm curious if anyone in the call has questions instead of us going through all the uh, the bills that Deed was proposing, and if you have any specific question before uh, Devin leaves the call, and uh, maybe I can um, wait a minute or two for you to ask any question about a bill that Deed was sponsoring that you have a question about. As we um, wait on, on on people to look into that, I know that. One of the major bills that we were looking at was the uh, paid uh, family medical leave. Um, we, is that still in the omnibus bill or how? where is that at there? Yeah, um, so paid family leave is actually being discussed on the house floor right now. So if mm -hmm. you were to tune in to, 
to the House TV, you would see them debating that bill um, and they'll probably take a vote on it today. And then later, I think this week, they'll do it in the Senate. That bill is traveling separate from our omnibus bill. So some things we're tracking of uh, our omnibus bill with all the deed, main deed programs in one, paid family in another, some UI stuff in another. So um, yeah, paid family leave is, that's what I was doing uh, before I jumped on this call, was listening to the paid family uh, discussion. Well, thank you so much, Devin. If there's no any other questions, We'll let Devin uh, leave and get back to uh, the important that work that he's doing. Um, so thank you so much, Devin, for joining us. And before we proceed uh, to the next <clears throat> uh, invitee that we have, uh, I want to give a shout out to um, Linda, who's sent on the chat that um, the Council of Minnesota of African Heritage um, will definitely uh, work with us uh, uh, to, to get the honor uh, past, thank you so much. And then that's the same um, uh, message we have across um, our ethnic councils. And then we, we have a lot of support from everyone uh, to get this, pa this bill passed. And um, we will definitely um, have something important uh, at the end of the day uh, for all our communities and to uh, improve the lives of immigrants in Minnesota. And uh, that's the goal that we all have and we'll all work uh, towards that. I think, so thank you so much, Linda. Um, next, as you may know that when um, I was announced as the uh, Assistant Commissioner for uh, Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, uh, there was two other uh, positions that were, were announced uh, by deed. One was the other Assistant Commissioner, um, Elizabeth, um, who um, is doing a different program and maybe we'll have her on the call another day. But today we are excited to have uh, Nila uh, Mulgard, who's uh, who's been named as the um, executive director for um, the um, um, small business office. I know many of you have asked a lot about entrepreneurship, startups, and and that environment. And now we're excited to have an office that coordinates the small business efforts in the state. And so, Neela, please welcome. Do a short introduction about yourself, and then feel free to give an overview of the office and what 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 the office is here to help with the communities. Sounds good. Wonderful to, to be with all of you. And thank you for this opportunity to, to share a little bit about our, our new office and some of the programming that uh, not only our office offers, but colleagues with Indeed and, and those of you out in the community that we partner with. Um, can everyone see my screen? Right? Okay. Um, when I spoke with the uh, assistant commissioner today, he wanted me to go over a little bit about our new office and uh, some of the resources that we have available, some of the funding. And I also see my colleagues on here from the Office of Business Finance who are, are experts in some of our fundraising, but I'll just provide a very, very high overview and they can uh, help fill in any, any questions. So, so first of all, as, as you know, DEED's key goal is to enhance Minnesota's economic vitality by creating an environment that's, that's really ripe for business growth. And that starts with small businesses. Small businesses are the foundation of our economy, of our main streets, and it really, they help us stay um, competitive and help with economic growth. And so clearly, small businesses make a big impact, and some of these statistics show that. They employ three-fourths of all employees in Minnesota. 61,000 new business starts just last year, and based on the federal SBA um, data, 99.4% of all businesses in Minnesota are considered small businesses. So what you're doing and the, and the businesses that you're serving have a, have a big impact. I, I now have the honor to, to talk about our new team. To better meet the needs of our entrepreneurs, our small businesses, Deed created the Office of Small Business Development. And so we're working with startups, small businesses, and the organizations across the state that also support them. So we brought together four offices that you see here. We have the SBDC offices. Um, they provide no cost, uh, free consulting. They provide a training, assistance, help securing different capital. Um, we are excited to announce a new uh, director, state director, that will be starting next week. So the SPD centers are an incredible resource. 
The other uh, group is called our Small Business Assistance Office. We have staff that answer emails and an 800 number. It's really the front, the front door, the first point of contact that we're making at DEED for any entrepreneur, any business that might have questions from um, you know, where to go next, what publications they need to go, how to register, what type of license they might need. It's really, we want to make it easier for businesses to navigate. And so we're saying the assistance office should really be that, that first point of contact. Then we have the small business partnership group uh, that help distribute millions of dollars to our nonprofit community and other organizations to help uh, provide that technical assistance and business support, which I, I see here, many are, are part of that. And then we also have Launch Minnesota, a collaborative effort uh, working with partners across the state to enhance and elevate our innovation ecosystem. And when we brought all these areas together, there was really three common threads that we all worked on. One was connectivity. Um, we work with public and private partners to make sure that it's easy for businesses to find what they need uh, at the right time. Um, business owners should not are not in it alone, though I know many times they feel that their journey is pretty lonely. Um, and so we find numerous ways, and we're going to be uh, launching other ways in the near future of ways to connect uh, the businesses and entrepreneurs to the resources that they need. The second one is capacity, providing the know-how, the training, the education, the mentors, technical assistance that businesses may need. That could be internally through our SBDC offices, through our launch partners, through our higher ed um, network and institutions. And it can be through our nonprofits and our grantees and our partners across the state. And then last, uh, it's capital. We provide, as I mentioned, millions to nonprofits to help with that technical assistance. We also provide a lot of capital to businesses directly. And so one thing that I was gonna, was asked to share about today was about some of that funding. So let me give you a, a high level breakdown of some of it. And I will also put in chat a handout that might be helpful. It's it's being updated, but that might be something for you to, to follow there. Um, and once again, I said my experts, my colleagues from the Office of Business Finance are also on the call. So I, I lean to them for, for all the details. But first we have grants and direct investments. So we have the innovation grants through Launch Minnesota. We have 1.5 million a year for high growth, high tech startups. We've given out about 6.5 million since the inception just under three years ago to over 200 businesses. And we've seen incredible uh, growth with that. We've seen a $12.40 rate, rate of return for every dollar we've invested. We have the angel tax credit that right now is under legislation. We don't have funding right now in 23. Hopefully we will after this legislative session, but that provides a 25% tax credit to investors or investor funds. For in, um, So it's a, it's a nice way for our state to stay competitive and seek private dollars from others within um, the state and outside of our state. We also have a step grant for companies that are looking to export their products or services to foreign markets. And then we now have new funding, and I see Drew's on here, with our SSBCI program. We've partnered with the University of Minnesota, our state-sponsored entity, to provide this direct investment uh, capital in a fund-to-fund -fund and also a direct investment. Um, we also have loans with Indeed that are managed by our Office of Business Finance. Um, the, the growth loan fund and the automation loan that you'll find on that handout both our internal programs that are part of our SSBCI program. And then we also have the Indian uh, loan program that supports the development and members of the federally recognized Minnesota based band uh, or tribes. Um, an average of that loan is about $57,000. Then we also work with partners. Uh, some of you are on the call where we provide funds to others um, to um, manage and, and execute some other loans. So these would be the Emerging Entrepreneur Loan Program. I see Jason on the call, he's managing that program. So this program is for small businesses 
uh, majority owned and operated by one or more women veterans, BIPOC, low income or disabled individuals. We have the loan participation program and the loan guarantee program. Once again, two new uh, loan products from SSBCI that we are working with lenders to get more capital out to our business community. And that is just a very high level um, overview of some of the resources that we have. And, and really when you look at our new office and some of the work that we have been doing and look to do in the future, we hope that we can provide these three impacts to businesses. One, saving the businesses time to help navigate what is available to them and what they qualify for and who they need to talk to and when. Hopefully increase the access to funding and capital, uh, whether it's state, federal, local, county, or other through other partners and loan products. And then also increasing the support services available to them. Um, so they have the the, the talent, the know-how, the the knowledge to know um, and to know that what they need to do to be a successful and thriving business. So that is that is it for today. Is there any questions for myself or any of my colleagues at Deed? Good. Good afternoon, uh, Linda Sloan. I'm not sure if I was supposed to raise my hand, but just a quick question for you. Are all of the offices, the I think you had three or four buckets, are they all open and operating, especially the one uh, regarding providing assistance? Yes, they are all, they have all been um, working. It's just, they're not new offices. We're just the this the office of small business development is the new office bringing all of those four areas of focus together. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, all of the areas have been doing incredible work <laughs> for many many years. Yeah, and and to just to expand on that too. Sometimes um, it's good to know. Deed has does a lot of the. Um, you know, client facing uh, uh, services through our uh, partners. And so a lot of these offices you would see, uh, they interface with, uh, with organizations, you know, and, and, and those who implement uh, this work uh, within the community. So um, I just wanted to mention that. I see on the chat that there's, um, you know, Jason and then there's Asset who also is, is um, I'd say they, they do have that ELP program and, um, and these are um, these are uh, organizations that you can reach out to um, if you are as a, a business owner or a person who has, is interested in in in, in um, getting those services offered to them. Um, maybe we will have. Uh, I think when if you go to a website, there is a way you could find uh, all the partners that implement uh, the grants. Um, I'll find that link and post it out. But um, just waiting for other questions for Neela or for any of us. Um, if you have a question, please go ahead and just unmute yourself and, and we'll wait. Well, thank you very much, Assistant Commissioner. My question is that uh, uh, what about some of the requirements? I know you are you're trying to give us the overview, which is good, but uh, on emerging loan, are there any specific requirements? Do you have to be in business for two years or et cetera? Do you have to have capital business plan or how does it work? Right, every loan is a, is a bit different. Um, Drew or Jason, if you want to talk about maybe some of the, the loans that you're working with specifically, but each one has its own uh, requirements and characteristics. Hi, hey, Mila. Um, well, for the intermediary ones that Neela was talking about, like loan guarantee and participation, and I guess I can speak on behalf of Jason too, for the emerging entrepreneurs, um, the lenders that get applied to directly for those have the credit making decision, and then they would reach out to Deed um, essentially as a way um, 
to fill some sort of a gap need um, because there is some reason that the the credit requires um, some additional uh, like backstop in the case of the guarantee program or is trying to um, uh, stretch the capital of the organization that's making the loan for the other for participation and, and um, emerging entrepreneurs. Jason, you can add to that if you want. Uh, I think you answered it beautifully. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Jason and Drew, and um, that's that's amazing. Uh, all these the team members are joining the call and asking questions as 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 you um, as they come. Um, I just want to thank you for joining us. I I didn't even know you if you're on the call. Now we have the questions that are coming out and you responded so perfectly. Um, but again, that's why this forum is there for for you as the client uh, to ask questions, and this forum helps you um, get to connect with the staff. Um, that you might not otherwise um, connect with uh, some other day. So please feel free to um, type in the questions if you have before we go to the next uh, presenter. If there's any other further questions, we'll probably do that towards the end of the call. Um, any other questions before we move on? Beautiful. So our next uh, presenter, um, Cameron uh, Mack, um, with Indeed LMI office, uh, there's been a couple of uh, uh, publications that they did uh, articles or, or, or research uh, data that, that was released. Uh, back, uh, Cameron, what we, we first started with the, um, the data we released on, on um, um, you know, people of African heritage. And then uh, later on this last week, we released uh, one on the Latino Hispanic um, um, data. So you can go ahead and please uh, talk into uh, those data. And then if you have questions, we will take them after we have presented. Yes, thank you, Assistant Commissioner Mohammed. Can you guys see my screen all right? Yeah, you can see yep. the presentation. OK. Yes. Um, so uh, I actually got to join Assistant Commissioner Mohammed uh, this morning for another meeting talking specifically about the Hispanic or Latino report that we put together and recently published on our website, but um, thought I could come in real briefly and share some information uh, about the importance of immigration in Minnesota's economy. So uh, my name is Cameron Mott, and I'm the Regional Analysis and Outreach Manager in the Labor Market Information Office at DEED. Um, so I just have a real brief, um, not super formal presentation, try and get through it relatively quickly and can maybe answer some questions if they come up. Um, but, but please know that we are a resource for you. And so if you have additional follow-up questions afterwards, uh, we actually have a team of five regional analysts stationed across the state. So no matter where you're located, whether it's Twin Cities metro area or greater Minnesota, there is an analyst that's available to help. Um, provide data and try and answer questions for you. Uh, so um, we, we've talked quite a bit, um, especially in recent, recent years, about the importance of immigration to Minnesota's economy overall. And so uh, I have some data shared here, and then uh, at the end of the presentation have links to a couple of the more recent articles that we've put together that talking about this specific topic. Um, but you can see in Minnesota, we have nearly a half a million foreign born residents, so almost 500,000 people that call Minnesota home as of 2021. And that number has been uh, increasing pretty rapidly uh, over the years. Um, and so this population, the foreign born residents, include citizens and non citizens, students and workers, and refugees who have fled their home countries, um, all would be considered foreign born residents. Um, according to these calculations. And the data that we're using here is coming from the US Census Bureau. Um, in 2021, about eight and a half percent of the state's population was foreign born. Um, and again, that's a pretty substantial increase over time, uh, almost a 31% increase just over the past decade. Uh, in, in terms of uh, country of origin, um, foreign born residents from Asia have been our state's largest immigrant group since 1990. Um, foreign born residents from Africa now can constitute the second largest immigrant group and were the fastest growing uh, group uh, over the past decade. And then the third largest uh, source of immigrants in Minnesota is Latin America um, uh, with about 110,000 people 
uh, in, in the state of Minnesota. Uh, and we have this the same type of, of detail and the same type of information available for the state as a whole. Uh, in this table here, I'm showing the Twin Cities metro area because that is where the largest percentage of the state's population overall and also the state's foreign-born population is located. But um, we can break this same type of information down by region or even by county um, based on what your need might be. Uh, what we're, what we're seeing is uh, even though the largest numbers uh, are located in the seven county Twin Cities metro area, uh, immigrants are transforming many smaller communities across the state. Um, and probably the best example is Worthington, which is a city in southwest Minnesota in uh, Nobles County, where nearly one in three residents um, is reporting as being foreign born. Um, there are certainly some, some differences between uh, the state's US born population and the state's foreign born population. Um, one of the biggest differences being the demographic profile. So foreign born residents have a much younger age profile than the US born population overall. And you can see in this uh, chart in the lower right hand side there, it shows uh, over 60% of foreign born residents are between the ages of 25 to 54 which we consider the prime working years, uh, compared to about 38.5% of the total population in the state that are in those prime working years, 25 to 54. Um, and so that obviously has a significant impact on our labor force uh, overall. Um, because there are so many people who are in their prime working years, the labor force participation rates for foreign-born workers are, are um, extremely high. Um, as you probably are all well aware, um, the state has been dealing with a very tight labor market. Um, and, and since uh, 2017, and I think I have it on the next slide here, we've had less than one job seeker available for every job vacancy in the state of Minnesota. Um, our labor force growth has, has slowed considerably from where it was um, three decades ago. So in the 1990s, you can see, again, in that chart on the lower right-hand side, the state averaged about 41,400 net new workers per year. So those are people who were graduating from high school or graduating from college or moving in from other states or other countries um, that were being added to our labor force or um, females who were entering the labor force during that time frame. The state's labor force growth then slowed down to less than 13,000 new workers per year in the 2000s, although there were two um, pretty significant recessions that happened during that time frame as well, which, which certainly slowed things down. Uh, then the state was back to averaging about 19,000 new workers per year in the 2010s. Um, and this was when the front end of the baby boom generation was starting to reach retirement age. And so we were expecting to see labor force slow down overall. Um, but because the economy was so was doing so well, the labor market was so tight, a lot of people were staying in the labor force longer. You can see that um, that red bar there on the far right hand side. The state of Minnesota lost about 100,000 workers um, in the first year of the pandemic. Um, that was a pretty substantial decline. And we have started slowly uh, regaining workers, but there are certainly still challenges in the state. Um, and, and one of the constraints that we have on, on our economic growth is just not having enough available workers. Um, but immigration was extremely important to the state's labor force growth over the past decade. In fact, uh, about half of the state's labor force growth over the last decade, so between 2011 and 2021, was foreign-born workers. And labor force participation rates, again, um, primarily due to demographics, but also uh, a lot of other factors, are significantly higher for foreign-born um, workers than they are for US born workers. Uh, the table in the lower left hand uh, corner shows the state's labor force projections over the next decade. And again, you can see that the state's labor force growth is, is expected to continue slowing down. So even if we were able to gain 100,000 workers, that's the equivalent of about 10,000 additional workers per year, which would be the slowest amount of labor force growth that we've seen over the past four decades. <clears throat> um, a couple interesting trends that we can point out. Uh, one is um, foreign-born residents who have lived in the U.S. for more than 10 years um, have higher levels of labor force participation and higher levels of employment um, than for the state's U.S.-born population and also for newer foreign-born residents who have entered um, since 2010. 
Um, and again, this is, is such a critical issue for the state's economy because um, as of right now, so we, we just released the job vacancy survey for 2022. And at that time, um, we had more than two jobs available for every unemployed job seeker in the state of Minnesota. So um, we still need more labor force growth to, to fill the jobs that employers currently have. Um, and there are certain industries and certain occupations that absolutely rely on uh, immigrant labor. Um, so this nearly 40% of butchers and meat packers in the state, more than 30% of software developers and computer application and systems engineers, and more than 18% of personal care aides are, are foreign born in the state of Minnesota. So industry, um, you know, the largest industries in the state, uh, healthcare and social assistance, manufacturing, retail trade, uh, all of those are industries that rely heavily on foreign born workers in order to fill jobs that they have available. Um, I'll jump through this really quickly, um, not because it's not important, but because I wanna stay on time here if I can. Um, there, are, there are disparities in Minnesota's economy. Um, and so the slide is just showing the, the differences in labor force participation rates by race uh, in the state of Minnesota, and then in comparison to the United States as a whole, um, and uh, across uh, several race groups uh, actually have higher labor force participation rates than the state's white population. And you can see um, the other, uh, that labor force participation rates are on an upward trend line for uh, workers of other races and are on a, a slow but steady decline for white workers in the state of Minnesota. And then there are also disparities um, in unemployment rates as well. There are systemic barriers that exist in our economy. And so um, this is just highlighting the, the difference in uh, unemployment rate between the state's white uh, unemployment rate and for other races and origins. Um, and then also the, the chart that's on the right hand side is the comparison of the, the state of Minnesota and the United States as a whole. In general, um, our rates are lower than the US rates, but the gaps um, between white and other race groups tends to be larger. Um, those gaps had been narrowing uh, throughout the last decade, uh, but then the pandemic kind of uh, change things, especially on a short-term basis. Uh, so this last slide is kind of just a, a quick overview of the intention of the reports that Assistant Commissioner Muhammad was referencing earlier. Um, the state uh, has produced reports on Black or African-American residents and Hispanic or Latino residents, and is currently working on reports for uh, Asian or other Pacific Islanders, and also American Indian um, uh, populations in the state of Minnesota. Um, and then uh, another thing that I want to point out, um, Anthony Schaffhauser, who is the regional analyst in Northwest Minnesota, he's located up in Bemidji, uh, in the March issue of Trends, he also wrote a, a story about um, how regaining immigration levels will, can help resolve Minnesota's tight labor market. Um, there, there's a tremendous amount of information available on our website. Again, you can certainly reach out to any or all of us um, for additional detail. We'd be happy to provide that to you. Um, but the, in, in conclusion, we know that immigration has been and will continue to be a vital source of new workers for our state and, and their full participation in Minnesota's economy will help make our state stronger. Um, I hope that that's helpful and I hope that I can answer any questions that you might have. I'll hand it back over to you, Assistant Commissioner. Thank you, Cameron. That's really helpful. <clears throat> Again, as a reminder, the reason why we have this data is, is to um, use it to influence um, the, the image that immigrants do bring or are very vital to our economy and that should influence policy because if we're doing the numbers and, and the policy is not changing, that, that is something that we, we, we will not be helpful. So uh, the main reason we have this data is to support um, the budget proposals that we're doing, the, 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 the programs that we are running to show that uh, these are helpful and in the long run, it's good for our economy. And I want you to use this data um, and we will share these uh, presentations as many of you have asked in the chat 
uh, to, to, to tell everyone, your, 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 um, your leaders and, and elected officials that this is uh, the latest numbers from D that shows that with immigrant communities and with um, you know, um, latest newest uh, arrivals in our communities, if we support them, uh, it's, we will see the results in the future. And of course that will contribute to um, a greater success for everyone. Uh, so that's the main reason we have this numbers and we will share those uh, uh, um, presentations uh, with you all, uh, Michelle and uh, I think uh, Ms. Hosuda, but we'll, we'll share it with everyone who needs it. Uh, please reach out to me, I'll put my email there. Um, but we'll open for questions before we go to the next uh, item on the agenda. Please um, unmute yourself. I see Aaron has, a, has his hand up already. Uh, I'll start with uh, Cameron, good seeing you again. Uh, I would certainly concur with the trends that we're seeing in terms of diverse populations. Uh, we have a significant uh, Hispanic population in, in Wilmer, uh, Minnesota, uh, about 25%, uh, at least 8% on East African. And it's in, been interesting to see also an increasing uh, Asian population in the last uh, couple of years, uh, Korean and other uh, groups from Asia. And I'm wondering if you're seeing that as well, uh, uh, kind of uh, certain trends on some of the different uh, uh, groups uh, from Asia. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that report has not been completed yet, but the the intention behind the report would be to provide some of those details and, and also to provide some geographic um, differences as well, you know, to show that it's, you know, certainly, again, a lot of the population in the state is located in the Twin Cities metro area, but there are pockets of uh, diversity in, in greater Minnesota. The, the report that we did this morning on Hispanic or Latino populations in the state of Minnesota, um, like two thirds of the state's Hispanic or Latino population is located in the seven counties, but the 14 counties with the highest concentrations are all located in greater Minnesota. And so providing some of that, that detail is extremely important in the, real, the articles and the reports that we put together. Thank you. Yep, and it's good to see you, We're like 15 minutes apart and then we have to see each other virtually. <laughs> Uh, Go ahead, Asad. Uh, thank you, uh, this is Commissioner Abdul uh, uh This is a great presentation. I really appreciate for your time on putting together all this kind of information. It's just my my comment is about uh, uh, the the last presentation. Uh, I have seen a number of the African born. Uh, African foreign born Africans in Minnesota was about 133,000, I think, if I am correct. So that number does not include uh, those who born in, in Minnesota. And uh, I think, uh, you know, kids who born here from African descent. Uh, the other thing also I have seen a lot of government, government data is that this kind of number is based on census and Many, many people of uh, you know African immigrants, especially the, the Somalis, the East Africans, they came to this country for G camps. Many of them they are very illiterate, even in reading or writing English, forget about English, but even their own language. So uh, we have many more people than we have, you know, this kind of data. This data, the numbers, usually the census had those who put their uh, I was working with a lot of, you know, uh, census people for the last decade. And I have seen so, so many people, almost 30% of the uh, of this uh, is African immigrants. They don't put their names or uh, into this census data. So just based on the needs of the services in terms of business, labor force or anything, we have to know that there is a whole lot of people who are not counted in this uh, data that we have available. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate that comment. Um, uh, the, I, I think it would be safe to say that the numbers are underreported, but 
that being said, I don't know how to provide anything different. Um, like, I don't know how underreported they are. Um, and so, you know, certainly there are opportunities to increase outreach to get better representation. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Cameron. That, that is what I was going to mention. Um, yes, we do need a lot of outreach. Um, and of course, addressing the barriers, like you say, you know, language access and, 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 and reading and, and writing. And sometimes if this technology you know, involved, then we'll talk about, you know, um, outreach and, and, and helping literacy, digital, digital literacy. So these are the barriers that, of course, we will, uh, we're looking at that, that is um, making the communities undercounted. And I think there was a couple other concerns from, from, from our Hispanic and Latin community this morning as well uh, about some limitations of the data and, and, and also, you know, where is the data from 2022, for example, that kind of uh, information. But again, as a reminder, these are uh, data that we want to show uh, the trends. And if this has been the trend um, for the past couple of years, uh, that will give you a good image of what we expect. Uh, to do, and that that should influence uh, the policy that we're we're trying to uh, to influence. So, um, as a reminder, that's what the data is really here to help. I said, do you have any follow up questions? I can see you're nodding your head. Uh, you no, know, actually, I I agree with you guys. Uh, if we don't have any other information, there is no way we have an accurate, uh, uh, you know, numbers in there. I, I I totally agree with you, Hab, it's, it's the most possible numbers, but I, I al we also know that no matter how much outreach we did, uh, still there are some people who are missing, especially if technology, English language barrier, uh, and, and some people, they don't even uh, know what census is. They don't know the importance of census. They don't know, some people that are very suspicion, suspicious about even putting their names and family size and age and all that kind into a government data. So maybe in relation with immigration status or something else. So I, I agree with you that uh, having an, an accurate 100% uh, counting of everybody is really tough, but more outreach as you mentioned and uh, more work will really bring uh, bring more people into this uh, census numbers and into the workforce. Thank you, I said, um, we really appreciate that comment <clears throat> and that, that will inform the work that we will do as well. I see two other hands up, Habiba and then Hulda. Yeah, my question is for uh, Cameron. Uh, when you are completing uh, this outreach for data and, and getting this uh, data completed. Are you working with uh, perhaps local organizations who do work uh, with um, African and immigrant um, maybe to provide feedback or help to complete uh, the survey so that you are able to collect the accurate data needed? Uh, we absolutely will work with um, different organizations. Uh, so the challenge within the labor market information office is we don't actually run the surveys that the Census Bureau is doing. Um, we are, it, it is secondary research for us, not primary research. We don't have the resources um, to be doing primary level um, research uh, in communities, and so we have to rely on outside sources. Uh, that being said, it, you know, if, if we were, if if groups were providing us with relevant information, we would absolutely include that in the fuller report or the fuller article that we're putting together. If I just add one more thing about uh, uh, our organization, you should get a every 10 years we get a contract with the county and and some state agencies to do a census. I think this, the ultimate people who put together the census is the US Census Bureau, but the US Census Bureau get information from local governments, the counties, the states. So those are the people. I don't think any agency, I mean like DID or DHS or you know Minnesota Housing, I don't think those agencies get a specific census numbers 
the census usually are a collected effort by different agencies that go all the way to the US Census Bureau. And that's how agencies get numbers, I think. Thank you, sir. I think we'll go to the next um, to save time holder. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner. Uh, this is Hulda Hiltzley, um, community leader here within the Brooklyns. And um, I, I wanted to echo what my sister just said, and that's the, I had a question for Cameron as well, and I think she asked it, she asked that question and Cameron answered that. Um, also, I had a comment in regards to data. Um, as, as especially immigrant communities, whether that is African immigrants, whether that is Asian immigrants, go. Um, what we are lacking especially within the African, let me speak on the context of the African immigrants, is the data, relevant data that supports a lot of the programming that we want to see, a lot of the change that we want to uh, work on. And so, for example, um, when I was the former president of a Kenyan organization um, here in, in Minnesota, and what I realized is that the organization itself didn't even have the resources to commission a study. Yes. Um, in regards to data within, you know, the Kenyan immigrant community. And so we were fortunate enough to get a grant from the foundation, from the Minnesota Council of Foundations, and we were able to commission a, a, a study, right? That allowed us to gather data, especially during the COVID, the, the, the height of the pandemic, and we gathered a 52-page report. On, on data on Kenyan immigrants and, and just looking across, you know, how COVID was, you know, had impacted that. So going back to Cameron and the work that you, your team is doing and then tying in what my sister has talked about, um, it's, it's very critical that we invest in data collection, relevant data that actually, you know, looks at, you know, the numbers of African immigrants. And, and I would suggest, you know, especially within uh, commi uh, assistant commissioner's team, if there are resources there where you can bring in key stakeholders within the various communities that you want to target that you see lacks that data and, and really work with us community leaders to come together and formulate, you know, a project initiative of data collection, right? We can, we can, you know, sit down and talk about what that scope looks like, but at least have that project initiated so that, you know, when somebody like Cameron is putting together an overall, you know, report, it's comprehensive. And the voices of the community are a part of that because we do have people who are willing and actually are in need of this data, but we just don't have, especially the smaller um, organizations, we don't have the resources to gather that information. And then to be honest, to this day, I'm looking at the report that, you know, we were able to, you know, the, the research that went into that report, it's still relevant, but is it starting to get outdated? Absolutely. And so for me, my recommendation to this group and to assistant commissioner is to consider such a project because ultimately, you know, we all know that data drives decisions. And we have, when we have accurate data, it, it, it drives decisions that actually bring the positive impact and the sustainable impact that we wanna see. So that's something that I definitely want this group to think about and, and, and maybe even create a smaller group that really can drive that project initiative if that hasn't been thought out yet. Great comments, Hulda. I, I really appreciate that. And, and ex that's exactly why we have uh, this data. And that's why we need to have more data, um, more disintegrated data uh, that, that can, you know, the overall data, then we need, we need to disintegrate that, that data to specific communities and industries. And, and, and yes, I really support the, what you said. And um, we'll definitely take that to heart and um, let you know when we have such programs. I think there's another hand that's up, uh, unless you have something that you wanna to add to Cameron. No, uh, I love to hear this. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Girma? Huge supporter of data collection, so the more and better we can do, I'm on board. Uh, hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for what you're doing and the, data that you gave us is so critical. We all know that. And I just seconded what Ulda just said. And this is not enough. And working with the communities, uh, based organization is so important. And, you know, last 
before this last sentence, we have done outreach uh, in our community. Uh, by the way, I'm from Oromo Community of Minnesota or from Oromo Culture and Institute of Minnesota. So we try hard, but the outcome is so low. We need to know uh, how this is important for our community or for the state at large. So we haven't done enough and the state need to come up with a good approach that includes all the communities. You know, we need even census in, 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 in state level, not just federal level every 10 years. We need every two years, every five years. We, we have to do that. If not, we are left out and we are not getting anything, we just complaining. And we as a community also, we need, uh, we have a job to do and we have to work with our community and engage our community and empower our community and request the resource from the state uh, and uh, at, you know, all level, which means, uh, you know, we need technical assistance, we need financial assistance, we need um, maybe, you know, consultants, so all this kind of assistance is needed. We really need to be counted. Our community needs to be counted. We have been saying, that, for example, in my community, uh, 40,000 people exist in, in the state of Minnesota, Oromo only. But we do not have like very concrete um, uh, data. The data need to be uh, well uh, entered. So please, uh, we need help from the, the state. Thank you so much, uh, Assistant Commissioner. Thank you for your organizing. I greatly appreciate your job and we are happy to support you in any level. Thank you, Girma, wise words. And uh, yes, thank you for supporting that. Uh, it, 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 it does look and uh, the way we were expecting it also to have uh, this data uh, be an issue within the community and everyone uh, does seem to support um, that idea. Uh, something for us to look into it. And um, uh, the chat has had a couple of inputs from, um, I can see from Tom and Mshale and, and Linda also shared a couple other sources that you could uh, uh, get data from. Uh, this is to show that, you know, state is not the only source of data, but um, there are other um, organizations or institutions that do run this kind of data. And it's good that you share that information among, so uh, we share that information among each other. That's why we have these platforms. Um, I'll probably invite um, Linda to say a few words about that ACS survey. Um, what was that? Hi, hi, this is Linda Sloan. Uh, I believe it's the American Consumer Survey, and I know that um, they are supposed to be either uh, releasing some new data uh, either this month or next month, or it, it was just released. I have to check, uh, but I believe that the state demographer uses some of that data as well as the census data. And that data, from my understanding, does get into some of the African uh, immigrant communities and in, in the breakdown. I have not seen it yet, but I know that we have pulled some of that information in previous years uh, for our annual report to speak about the African heritage community. But as soon as um, we know that it's available, uh, Flocka Me, who is also on the call, she's, she's our engage, community engagement manager, can reconnect with you guys. And I, I can reconnect with you and let you know what that looks like. Thank you, Linda. Um, Tom, you, you also shared a link about MN Campus. You wanna say a few words about that? But I think is is not on the call yet. But there is a link to that. Um, I will also mention the American Immigration Council does have a lot of data on states um, that that we can also share as well. Uh, the UFM, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank. These are all all um, institutions and, and and avenues that you can uh, also look in uh, to support your uh, projects. Um, any other question? I can see there's another hand that's up. Please go ahead. Sorry, Abdul, I was 
I was having to, this is Tom. Oh, Tom, yes. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I was drawing, my mic was acting up. Uh, yeah, I mean, just the link is there. I mean, Compass is a great uh, resource. We, we love it because, uh, 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 you know, they kind of look at different data. They, they combine both the census data and other data that they have collected the, themselves because uh, they're right in the community. So I think they tend to do a very good job, um, you know, just kind of aggregating uh, data and other uh, qualitative uh, uh, research that, that, that they do. So I highly recommend it. Thank you. For those of you who um, have not yet met Tom, Tom runs a, a local uh, ethnic newspaper, uh, um, media uh, organization, and um, he does know a lot about data and, and, and has all his uh, uh, sources. Uh, so good uh, good thing to rely on that. Um, perfect. Let me go to the hand that's up uh, and then Michelle. But there's, um, I cannot see the name, but it says Multicultural Kids Network. Thank you so much, uh, Assistant Commissioner Mohammed. Um, hello, everybody. This is Samba Fal from the Senegalese American Chamber of Commerce. Um, rightfully so, just following all our panelists here and also members, we do have a big number of West African um, scholars who are here in the U.S. Um, looking for those great Minnesota opportunities that we lure them into our state. But the immigration portion of it is it is so hard to be connected to this organization. Although the candidate might fit the profile they need, but because they are not resident or U.S. citizen, they pretty much are being turned out. Um, we would like to get the state to assist in that immigration pathway because these are people that definitely Minnesota does need. They have the mental resiliency. They have the academic background. We brought them over here. They see the layout. However, they're just having some hard time getting their, their connection to the, to the various tech industries or new innovative industries. And these government that we're dealing with to bring their scholars into Minnesota are now asking us questions. To, to get to that data will really assist us to really back ourselves by saying that this is what the state is working on, reason why it is taking time for those um, economic collaborative to occur, because it is, it is a win-win situation. Now immigrants are coming into Minnesota and able to really benefit their home countries prior to becoming a US citizen. So again, thank you so much for allowing us to talk and also to, to applaud everybody for the great work that is being done for the African heritage community. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sam, I appreciate it. Um, we had another hand up from Michelle, but um, looks like you lowered your hand. Um, I will go ahead and go over to Mark Majors, our Deputy Commissioner for uh, uh, Workforce Development, Ever Indeed. And Mark will, first, of course, um, is excited to be here and to join us today and also to share some of the um, um, work that, that's ahead. Thanks, uh, Assistant Commissioner Mohammed. It's good to, good to be here, folks. Uh, again, Mark Majors, Deputy Commissioner for Workforce Development. I've uh, been kind of listening in on a very uh, lively and informative uh, conversation about data. Uh, me and Mr. Mock have actually had um, a lot of the same conversations that have kind of come up. Um, and so I think some of your, uh, your insights and your comments are very much well received and appreciated. You know, I think we, we, we work with the data that we have. Um, and, and Cameron's been uh, very thoughtful of trying to kind of put together a, a report um, that is about as um, comprehensive as he possibly can with the data he has. But I understand that there's some additional sources uh, that's been uh, offered up, and I'm sure he'll take a look at that to be inclusionary. And I just want to say, you know, I think that, you know, the, the disaggregation of the data is is very critical and i think you know and i know cameron knows that um and we've like looked at different ways on how we can do it because going to the point at least when i walked you know i came into the conversation that helps with understanding like what are the services and the and the needs that the community may have based upon what you're kind of seeing in the data you may see um and when we start lumping you know groups of folks together based upon their skin color um and their experiences may be different that's can be problematic and challenging all the same. And so 
you know, we'll do our best as I mean, I think this is kind of our, our you know, our, our run at it, uh, but we will get better as we, you know, keep, uh, keep doing these thing, uh, reports um, and your insights and your recommendations and, um, and thoughtful comments are always very helpful. So appreciate it. Um, just kind of one, but speaking to that, you know, one of the things when we talk about outreach and in terms of workforce development programs, we've had such a great, um, we're going through our legislative process where we have some really strong uh, governor and lieutenant governor budget priorities around workforce development and economic development. I'll talk about uh, workforce development with you all, um, where we're at the kind of the tail end of the legislative process. And, and one of the things that we're doing now is, now that we kind of have a sense of where the legislature is in terms of potential funding, is we're kind of starting to think about what our program models may look like in terms of uh, how we move forward and what you know what our RFPs will look like kind of coming out the door um, in the coming months. So right now, what we 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 are anticipating is that Deed has, in terms on the adult side, five five or six signature programs that it actually has had in prior prior years. Um, that's our Pathways to Prosperity grants. That's our Southeast Asian grants. That's our African Immigrant Grant, our Work Women's Economic Security Act. Um, and then there's a few more like uh, getting to work and family, uh, family resiliency uh, funds that will go out. And then we have some um, newer programs that are we're looking at, which three or five of them are. One is the Office of New Americans, as you all are very aware of. Um, we have one that's targeted populations and putting money towards both job skills and uh, entrepreneurial skills training, some capacity building for community-based organizations. I know that kind of came up early, earlier. Um, DEI training for small and mid-sized organizations. Um, and then we have what we're calling Drive for Five, um, which we're, you know, we're looking for an investment in what we've identified as high growth um, and with high uh, family sustainable wage training. Um, and so we're looking at five key industries in there, which are including caring professionals, manufacturing, um, tech, um, education, and um, labor, and uh, aka construction. And then we have an investment. We're looking for opportunity, hopefully, to make some investments in senior um, tr workforce training, which is uh, individuals 55 and older. Um, and then lastly, um, we're hoping for an investment in youth um, employment, which is a uh, doubling down on existing workforce programs for young people. So there's going to be more to come on those as we, the legislature, hopefully, you know, ominous bills kind of sews up those last uh, five that I mentioned. But I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to be coming around the state in five key areas around the state um, in the next, over the next two weeks to talk about the Pathways to Prosperity, the work, uh, Women's Economic Security Act, the uh, Southeast Asian, African immigrant, and uh, uh, family sustainable uh, resiliency uh, grants that are coming up in the, in the probably in the next, I would say next 40, well, 45 days at minimum from when the legislature is done with their work. Uh, we will be releasing those RFPs. So I'll be traveling around the state now uh, to start having those conversations in different parts of the state so that, A, make folks aware of the opportunities. Um, also, to kind of hear some feedback. Like I've heard some, a lot of good feedback on just the short time I've been on this, um, on this call. And so I really encourage you, we'll get the fly, they're in the process of putting together the flyer now to let folks know when I'll be traveling out. Um, Right now, it looks like in the city of Minneapolis and St. Paul will be next next Wednesday at about um, on the 10th, I think um, the 12th. I can't remember on 12th where I'm going. And then I'll be I'll be in Rochester on the 12th. Um, and then I'll be in central Minnesota on uh, the 24th and uh, the 23rd. Um, so um, we're going to be and then I'll probably have kind of a virtual um, opportunity for folks to kind of learn about the grant making opportunities that we'll have. And then when we get past the, and then I anticipate, again, I anticipate that the RFPs will go out for those probably about 30 to 45 days after legislature is done with their work. And then once we have a better understanding on these kind of new initiatives that I just announced, those will probably go back out and have additional conversations about what we're looking for in those targeted populations, drive for five, senior training program, so that folks are 
um, are aware of them and understand what they are, but we also want to get a little bit of feedback. Um, and then lastly, uh, what we're also doing is that we're in con we're in conversations with a group that will actually will be administering like um, a workshop on how to write grants. Um, so how to apply for the grants? What should you be looking for when you're looking at applying? What should be included in that process? And we'll hopefully we'll be rolling that out probably in about 30 days to, I have to wait to see what the legislature comes back to us on in terms of requirements for the grants. And then that will help us with finishing up what that, um, that training will look like. Um, that's something that I've, actually, when I've come to this group probably about a year or so ago, um, one of the things that came up, it was, um, was like, DEED has all these grants, but we just don't know all the mechanics about writing applying for them. And so we're going to have a third party do that training. Um, and so that folks can actually uh, have that in their back pocket. It will be free and it will be recorded. And it may be in multiple languages too. So we're trying to do, do as much as we can to make it accessible for all communities to participate or as many communities as possible to participate in the grant making process kind of coming up. So super excited about that. Um, and um, I'm hoping that we'll get to the dates once we, you know, or finalize all the logistics. And I invite you to participate. Um, I think the assistant commissioner is going to join me on one or two of those. Uh, so you get to see him in person as well. Um, and uh, love the involvement in the, uh, the opportunity to meet and see you all and hear from you. So I'll stop there because I don't want to take up too much more of your time. But um, if anyone has any specific questions about this uh, act, this tour, um, feel free. I'm available to answer questions now. Thank you, Mark. I think we have a question from Edmundo who's asking when will the meeting be in St. Paul and Minneapolis and will it be open to public? Yeah, um, it, I can't remember which one is, I think it's Minneapolis in the morning and it's St. Paul in the afternoon. I think, I think it, I, we can get you the, the dates and times. I was supposed to, to thinking, I'll just tell you the actuals on that and it's absolutely open we want community-based organization folks and if people in the community want to come and listen in they're welcome to it's about an hour um and it's really a chance for me to talk about the uh, grant making opportunities on the workforce development side so let me just be very clear about that this will be <laughs> workforce development not economic development they'll they'll do their own outreach on their side um and so um i, I we welcome for full participation Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Tom, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, actually, I just wanted to say uh, thanks. Uh, that's a good point that uh, uh, Commissioner Majors just made uh, about uh, a lot, you know providing resources for folks to uh, land the grant making process, the training. So I think that's a really good one. I think it's going to benefit quite a number of uh, uh, folks that have been getting stuck with the. Uh, <laughs> with not being able to apply for those things. It can, it can be a bit intimidating as somebody who has done them before. Yeah, and I'll say, you know, things, Tom, and I'd say the other half of that is we want to make sure we're giving people um, as much information to help folks along. And then on the other side, we're also doing some stuff internally too, you know, with training our internal staff around reading the applications as well. Because we know sometimes people, you know, language is uh, not everyone's first language. And so, you know, we've been training our internal teams of reviewers to also kind of be mindful of that as people are looking at responses. And then the third thing is we'll also be looking for community um, um, reviewers as well. You know, we've had in the past almost 50% of the folks who are reviewing our RFPs are people from the community because that voice is so important to have at the table because that's the voice that actually knows the folks, you know, knows the programs on the ground, but also knows the populations and is connected to the population as well. So we will also be sending out information like if you know folks and we encourage if folks who are maybe not um, applying for the grants, but uh, maybe from the community who want to be part of the process of helping decide who the potential grantees are, we welcome, uh, welcome those voices to the table as well. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Assistant Commissioner, again, all of you. 
um, just my question is, will there be food? Will there be, will there be food? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do know, I know that, food, I know that food does bring the community together. Uh, and I do know that. I think we're, <laughs> but I think it, it'll be it'll be an hour at a time, so you know we may have some some soft drinks or something like that for people to consume. Oh, okay. okay, I'm just I'm just joking on the training part. So we all of us will get the email then. Yes. We will get the email and like usual, and then you can decide to attend. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, but but feel free to bring me a plate if you like. You know, I'm, 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 there's <laughs> okay. a reason we chose to make it after Ramadan, so feel free. <laughs> exactly. Um, any other questions? And I think we can um, thank you, Mark, for um, such a great um, um, points. And uh, I think the community appreciates um, <clears throat> those um, outreach that, that the office will be doing, especially at the workforce side. And uh, we do hope to hear the same from the uh, economic development side as well. Um, but if you have any of those questions that are not covered here in this uh, presentations, please reach out to me. My email is always there. I will follow up with you all to send out uh, um, uh, those dates to everyone who attended. And um, you will feel free to choose which one you will attend. Um, other than that, I will just go ahead and for the few minutes that are remaining, open up the, the, the floor. I know, Michelle, you had had your, your, your hand up early. Um, this is the time to always, you know, bring up any information you want to share with the team or ask questions. Um, I welcome anyone to just unmute yourself. Hey, thank you so much. I'll just be very brief. So my name is Michelle Rivero. I'm with the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs for the city of Minneapolis. And along with my counterpart, Evan Newley Ho, who's also on, um, we host a monthly Twin Cities Immigration Forum, uh, where we share information about federal immigration updates and also invite community members to share news that you may have, um, news of interest to immigrant and refugee residents. So our next meeting is next uh, Thursday. May 11th from 4.30 to 6. And I'm happy to put the link into the chat. I'm not sure if there's anything else you wanted to share too. Um, just uh, everyone's welcome. I hope you can join us at our forum next week. Thank you. Um, I know there's another um, event that we, we, we talked about, Immigrant Entrepreneur Summit event on May 17th. Uh, for those of you that, that are interested in learning uh, about entrepreneurship and, and small businesses, uh, please feel free to um, visit their website and see if that will work out for you. <clears throat> um, again, there was also um, a great news that was shared uh, on the chat by Tom. Um, our very own Kahin, who's been um, and given the uh, the award for the small national small business uh, person of the year, uh, that that's a huge award. Um, to put it into perspective, you know uh, those businesses that have won that award includes you know the Chopani uh, founder, for example. And so, um, but uh, again, when when he won the Minnesota Small Business Award, uh, we we were confident that he will bring it home from DC. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a moment of pride for everyone. Um, <clears throat> any other updates that um, uh, anyone is willing to share, please feel free. Otherwise, we're, we're happy to end the call early. And we'll, we'll of course, share the recording and we'll also share um, um, and, you know, notes of how we did um, up after this call. We'll, we'll post it in our website as well. Abdi, actually, to your, to your point about Kahin, uh, the SBA administrator actually is flying in tomorrow. I think they are, you'll see it later in the news. I don't think it's open public, but uh, the uh, the SBA administrator will be in town tomorrow uh, to present that award officially at, at, you know, at his own at uh, at uh, Tahin's restaurant uh, tomorrow. So, It'll be a good event to attend if you are out there. Yeah. It will probably will be the St. Paul one then, right? Yeah, I believe so.
thanks for sharing, Tom. Um, uh, again, thank you so much for joining us. I think I will just wrap us up today. Um, we'll share um, um, some of the um, uh, people who asked for the presentations. We'll share that with you. We have your emails. And you also have my email. If any other person is interested in, please feel free to uh, send me an email. I'll also share the, uh, the dates for the outreach events that we'll be doing, that Mark will be doing, and um, any other information that's relevant. Uh, again, the notes will be posted on our website, um, thanks to our communications team. And if there's, any, no, if there's no any other questions, thank you so much for joining us. We'll wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks. Don, I think you can uh, end the recording now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Brazil. Bye-bye. Thanks.